how about that? Do you see a uh, Chimera X and it's kind of crazy because I'm in video in it. Is that is that what it looks like to you? Looks great. Yeah. Yep. OK, so. Um, so I'm going to try to show you what Chimera X can do uh, using virtual reality to look at molecular structures and to look at um, some electron microscopy data. It can look at other kinds of data, such as medical imaging, you know, lung uh, CT scans or things like that. But I don't have time to show all the kinds of data, um, but other kinds of 3D image data work. Um, but molecule molecules and, and the e EM is really the core where most of the users, tens of thousands of users, use Chimera X. There are not nearly that many who are using virtual reality. That's small numbers because it's still pretty new technology. And we may see it like crash and burn here when I'm trying to do a live demonstration. I was very reluctant to even like agree to do this demonstration because watching somebody else put on a VR headset and do things is just a nightmare. I mean, you get none of the benefit of the beautiful immersion and stereo view as the audience there, only I get that. And, but I'm gonna try to make it as like convey as well as possible um, what the VR is like um, using some fancy technology where it's gonna show me and the models. Uh, so we'll see how that works. Um, it's using Steam VR and I'm on a Windows 10 computer. Uh, those are like standard for virtual reality. I mean, there are other virtual reality systems, uh, but that's what I'll be using. Okay, so uh, reiterating what Jeremy said, I um, want you to ask questions at any time. Just unmute, ask questions. I'm gonna do a demonstration and uh, go through it, but um, you could just watch my videos on YouTube where I do some similar things and you'll get an even better like cleaner view of the VR in those videos. So if nobody asks questions, that's kind of like there's no point in having this meeting. So please ask any questions. Uh, are there quest any questions? Yes? <laughs> I'd I'm mentioned, serious. I'd asked you last time what kind of camera you're using, and it's a real sense camera, which actually does some 3D interpretation and kind of works to pro provide the, the uh, augmented virtuality, as I believe it's called. Oh, okay, I didn't know that term. But you see this, uh, just what Jeremy's asking here, I have this model here and I have these weird cones on my hands. Those are digitally rendered, obviously, and it's blended with some real video of me being taken from a camera. And it's a fancy camera, it's a depth sensing camera. Uh, what the depth sensing camera allows is when this data is in front of me, it blocks me. But if I put it through my head here, well, now it's behind. And the way that works is the video camera we're using actually gives a depth for every pixel. And this is some like bleeding edge technology. This is a Intel real sense depth sensing camera. Let's see if I can. Uh, do you guys see my um, my other camera? My my just my. Yes, Teams we're looking view, at this one. Yep. yep OK, so I'm going to change it. I don't see that, but I'm going to try to point at my depth sensing camera. Oh, cool. Do you see yeah. this? It's on a tripod. And you have the tracker mounted on it. So yeah, and there's a vibe off. tracker on top, so it knows where it is. And this real sense camera, which is just like a stick of gum here, it has three video cameras in it. Two of them are infrared, and it uses those stereoscopically to determine the depth. And then it's hard to see, but one on the end is an RGB camera. That's that's what you're seeing in my screen share. And in the middle, there's an IR projector. I mean, this is a crazy device right here that's uh, allowing me to mix the real video with the VR. Um, and that's a, like a $300 camera that's about three years old. So it's a little bit behind the times in the technology. They have LiDAR based ones now. The effect is really nice though, it works good. Yeah, well, we'll see because I, I did a practice of this two hours ago and it froze three times and it, I couldn't get it started again. So I hope that doesn't happen, but we really are dealing with bleeding edge technology here. So uh, so let's go, let's go for this. Let me show you what it's like using Chimera X in VR. So the screen share, you see the Chimera X window and the video is playing with the graphics, which right now I have this electron microscopy data. And uh, any questions? I got to stop plenty of times for questions because 
there must be a lot of confusing things in what I already said. Any questions? No? OK. Really interrupt any time. I want questions. Uh, I'm just I'm just going to say, yeah. so it can handle the electron. So this electron microscopy, which is like um, like an image, kind of like an image stack, right? But um, it can handle molecules and like a million other types of data. And you can even connect to the databases and import the molecule data directly, directly from, or the electron microscopy data directly from the databases online. Anyway, this, da can, this data comes from the EM data bank, electron microscopy data bank. It was released just two weeks ago and published just two weeks ago. And it's what we're going to look at in this demo. It's a, which will spend all, spend all my time focusing on not just the electron microscopy, but atomic models too. And let me tell you a little bit about it. It's a, uh, actually, let, maybe, maybe first I'll make it look a little bit better. I'm going to bring up in VR the Chimera, some of the Chimera X user interface. Um, I'm going to, uh, I think I'm going to change the threshold level. This is the surface of a three of this three contour surface of the 3D image, but it's at a pretty high threshold. I'm going to change it to a lower threshold. I'm going to do that with the hand controllers because I don't have the keyboard or mouse or anything. And there's a toolbar in Chimera in Chimera X. I have it shown here. They're actually tabs because they're multiple. There's so many icons, and I'm going to switch to this mouse mode tab. OK, it's so what you would use if you weren't doing VR. You could switch mouse modes. And I'm going to switch to one here that says contour level. And I don't know if you'll be able to see this, but on my that yellow cone, the icon for the um, this is up for the thumb button. I press the thumb button on this contour level and now that mode is assigned. And now if I just point at my map and press the button, I can change the threshold level at which this surface is shown. Okay. So we're going to see a lot of this, assigning buttons to different modes, and I'm doing, going to do lots of crazy, crazy things with them. Um, the toolbar is also good for other things, like this view doesn't have any shadows on the EM data, and I'd like to add some shadows because you'll be able to see that it's made up of a lot of different proteins better if I do some shadows. So in the toolbar, I'm going to go to some graphics section, and say use this lighting mode with shadows and this will give you a little better view of the electron microscopy all right are there any questions is it working okay i don't know what you guys see i it's, in vr i see a black room i don't see what you're seeing i don't see my room i only see this data and these cones uh so is it looking okay it looks great it looks great okay. yeah it's looking great tom any questions about what we've seen so far? I have one. Um, sure. Is is the data live? Like, is it can it be a live feed to to generate uh, the molecules? Like uh, the data come from uh, outside source, like not on your computer. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So this data, I could have just fetched it from the electron microscopy data bank right at the start here, but it's 500 megabytes. And so it would take a little while. So it wouldn't work for a demo. So when I loaded it in Chimera X, I did it by saying open 2738, oh, that's the ID number of it, from EMDB. I, I typed a command and it just fetched it from the EM data bank. And the, we're going to look at some atomic models from the protein data bank. And I just said fetch. 70E2. This was some, this is the ID code of one of the atomic models. And it and it just brings it in. So yeah, it's very normal that you're working with a lot of data from databases, and you you just Chimera X knows these databases, and you just tell it ID codes and things. Get me this data. Get me that data. And then it's cached on your Windows machine. So this data that's 400 megabytes or 500 megabytes is sitting in my downloads folder under a, that under downloads Chimera X. It's keeping all of these fetched data files. Just real quick, I just want to mention you can see that every command that he does will be uh, will appear in the log on the right, and you can actually bring up a command line if you want to be able to um, use these commands. And it's great that I see that they're links, which mean, means that you can click on them and it'll give you more information about how to use the various commands so that you can select certain chains or 
move things. And you can see things that he's doing is just moving the VR camera, the window size. But then when you're doing other more um, complex things, it, it can be really helpful to have all those things right there. And also, I just want to mention, like, this is um, how much does the software cost? Like $250,000, 300000 for a license? How much, Tom? The license for Kubernetes? Yeah. Well, about zero dollars. Right? <laughs> so, yeah. Free. Uh, for yeah. academic use, okay. For I don't know if we have people from like pharmaceutical companies, but it is licensed for. I don't even know the price, but like it might be like a thousand dollars or oh, something. It's it's cool. not. Oh, okay, great. I did not. So I thought that they sure. could not use it in pharma at all, but they can. No, no, no. It's, it's, using pharma. it's just commercially awesome. licensed, and it supplements not very much, but it supplements you know the programmers who work on Chimera X. Right. Okay. The fantastic. Fun, the fun. And, hey, and, and I also want to mention. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead and finish, Jeremy, then I'll, then I'll have a question. Oh, yeah. so you can export the 3D models as objects that you're going to show? And then can you also export, I, I mean, I, I don't, uh, you know, I, the volumetric data, like, can you rent, uh, that is that can't be exported as a 3D model, can it? Or, yeah, it can. Like, suppose wow. I wanted to 3D print this guy. Uh, uh -huh. I can, STL is common format, stereolithography wow. format. And Chimerax knows a lot of formats. Um, Another common export format would be OBJ or GLTF. These are, you know, generic 3D um, object formats. And so, yeah, I can export this for 3D printing or for dropping into your Unity application or other 3D software. Um, and Phil, Phil, in our, one of our, um, uh, in another meeting, Phil had mentioned you can also export it as a certain type of file which you can open in a browser. So say you wanted to send it to like a, an investigator you're working with and say, hey, is this the right orientation or whatever? Then wh what is that? Is that the GLB? Or, oh, uh, right, right. Yeah, uh, so uh, there's a GL format called GLTF that yeah, it GLTF. exports, and there a web browser can display those GLTF files in 3D. You know, you rotate it around with the mouse to view awesome. it from different I'm angles. Since, since we're talking about the GLB files, they're also natively supported by Microsoft Teams. So if oh, you wow. if you save uh, if you just uh, save to the meeting chat a link to a GLB file, anybody that's running that meeting in Teams can click on it and see a 3D view of it. Awesome. That's that's awesome, and we should try that. But I'm not going to try it right now. Because, <laughs> right. Because, right. Because, one one more question. Uh, the, yeah. More questions. Keep going with the questions. Yeah. Yeah, hey Tom, this is um, this is Dave. I had a question about that um, that interaction paradigm you just you just demonstrated, right? Yes. Sure. You, you, you've got sort of you know you've got the two D desktop menu off to the side. You assign a button, and then you can look back at your data and make the adjustment while you're moving, right? And that's certainly an improvement. I know I've seen some a number of years ago where you would you you you'd look away from your data at the two D menu, make an adjustment on a little widget there, and then look back at your data and be surprised that you know a change had had happened. I'm curious, is there is there a goal for the interface to eventually be sort of you can keep your eyes on the data the whole time? You know whether there's you know small that would be great hands or a heads up display or something to that effect. That, that, that's a great question. That's a great question. And um, and what we see here is exactly what Chimera X shows on the desktop this is this user interface with all these buttons and toolbars and it even says in the toolbar it's a mouse mode it's not a vr mode because it's for people using the mouse but it also works with the vr controllers so it hasn't been tailored in any way for vr and that's a disaster because uh you really want to do things differently in vr i don't want to be trying to poke these things in the in this 2D panel, it's actually like, you know, much worse than using the mouse. But practically, we don't have like a team of five developers to work full time on VR to Correct. make the heads up display. And so I'll, I'll give you the realistic answer that there's no time soon that we're going to have a customized VR interface that like puts, say, all of these panels and controls from the desktop just say on your hands here so that you could just click on your wrist and like and you can see software like that that's going to be similar to ours a program called nano it's done by a startup company in san diego and they have totally custom they have a team of 15 people working full time on this for for a number of years now selling it to pharmaceutical companies 
I don't want to know what the license fees are, but they do have a free version and it has that kind of custom specifically designed for VR because that is their target. Whereas Chimera X, the real target is the desktop and this VR is an extra thing. Um, so, so yeah, it's a good question. Right now we're stuck. There's a, there's a great beauty of this current interface you're using the desktop interface, and if you know Chimera X, you know how to do almost everything in VR too, okay? Because it's not two different interfaces. So there is, you know, something nice about it. But essentially, because you can move the menu anywhere that you want to, you could move it in an orientation sure. so, so that when you click so the button, I'm, you could still look yeah, at Yeah, I, I what have you're it changing. facing you, but I can just I can just move it with my hand controller, and I can have it it right here. I can put the data in front of it. I can be, look, you know, here's the data at my hands, and here's the, let's see if I make this. Big. And this, Bill pointed out and, the nice conical shape helps to point to very specific points when you're trying to point out different things. Yeah, we're going to use like these crazy silly cones for pointing at atoms where things, they're very small. And so that's why the cones are, the crazy cones are here. Are there more questions? No, let's dive in. I want to dig into this thing and tell us what, okay, what's going on. This is some like crazy, amazing biology. OK, I was blown away. I just looked on Monday. This thing was just published in Science. Um, actually, Science Advances. I think it's like a fast track science. And uh, it is a in prokaryotes. It's in. Uh, uh, let's see if I remember the name of the organism. Uh, Damn it, I forget. Uh, Hal Halangium chloraceum. It's in a prokaryote, okay? I wanted to try to say its Latin name. I thought I tried to try to remember it because I thought I'll never be able, I'll never get a chance to say this in my life again. But I think I, I think <laughs> I've blown it. But it's a halophile, some salt, salt loving organism. And like a bag it, bacteria type of thing, uh, just yes. for the non biologists who don't, uh, so yeah. Yeah, so it's a bacteria. It's kind of bacteria. And um, bacteria and all in your body, you use iron, um, like your hemoglobin uses iron to carry all your oxygen. And this thing sequesters the iron, it like uh, accumulates the iron on the inside of this ball. And there's machinery inside this ball to, um, to convert iron in oxidation state two to oxidation state three. So it becomes from a soluble state to some mineralized state. So it's a little iron ball, and you have these two. Yours are different than this one, this ball, okay? Uh, because this prokaryote one doesn't do it quite the same way. But they, they're, people are really excited about the biology of this because it's like a little nano compartment. Inside, there are the things that accumulate the iron, some proteins, and they th and what people are excited about is they could re-engineer this. Instead of accumulating protein, there could be a drug inside that is shielded by this this it's an icosahedral um, shell, and that it would be a great thing to do engineering um, for medical purposes. So let's take a look at some of the details of that, and I'll show you the kind the kind of crazy stuff that's done with Chimera Chimera X by researchers. Um, any questions about about it? Okay, um, inside I told you there was this machinery. Let, how do we see inside? I'm going to slice it, um, just show a plane of it. I'm going to do that with some uh, toolbar button that says map. It has to do with, when it says map, it means like three-dimensional image data. And I'm going to say show one plane. And it's now showing me a plane. It looks pretty horrible for you because this background is so bright. But as I told you, for me, I don't see any of that. It's black in what I see in virtual reality here. So I got really good contrast. Let me improve your contrast quickly here by turning off my lights. I can find the light switch in my VR headset. Uh, did I do it? Yeah, there we go. It's darker. OK, here's the data. It's one slice it's of, that, of that ball. And I, you can already see some stuff inside. Let me move that slice around. I'm going to. I'm going to choose a mouse mode here that lets me move the plane. Mode is called move planes, and I can then slice through it here. And at some points we see we got three kind of balls here. 
actually, I remember sometimes I've like put it in front of my body. Let's see, in order to get better contrast, because I have this dark. Anyways, you got see three balls here, and at different depths, you can see like they're actually four inside. They're four like big pill-shaped things inside this. So we want to look get a better look at those. Uh, so let me go back to showing it as the full 3D surface. Uh, my map thing, I'm going to say show it as a surface. There's a little button. And then I'm going to say show the full. There's a little button that says show the full ball again. OK, there it is. And uh, let me turn my lights back on because that will help this depth sensing camera. All right, let's look at those four like balls that are inside that are sequestering the iron. How can we get another a better view of it? Well, one way is I'm in VR. I can just make this really big. Oh, it's pretty dark inside here. Uh, let me change the lighting back to the simple kind of lighting with no shadows so the interior isn't dark. And then let me make it big. And I'm just going to go inside on oh, the threshold level. Sorry, I'm going to make it small again. Uh, let me change the threshold level to a better threshold. Um, as I was showing you before, just the sign of mode, I'm going to make it a little lower. There we go. And if I make it big, I can just step inside here. And let's see, let's see what you see. I'm inside now. It looks and great, Tom. You, you can't see nothing. It looks horrible to you, I know. It's not bad. But I have stereoscopic vision with the VR, and I guess many of you have used VR before. And so I see the four balls totally clearly. I see their spatial relationships really well. So this is kind of cool, a cool thing about VR. I didn't need any clip planes, any special techniques to look on the interior. I just made it big and I, I stepped into it. Um, so I'm going to make it small, though, and let me show you a few other ways we do this. So one thing is I could just cut into this. So let's just do that. I'll just show you another mode. It's called uh, crop mode. I'll just Can you pull that forward? It's getting clipped. The menu's getting clipped a little bit. Yeah, the, this is a bug. Like that has to do oh, with right. my, it has to be large at the file. With has my to be large real enough. sense camera, if my data is small, then it clips away the stuff in the back, which were my my panels. It only clips them away for you. It's this, that depth sensing camera that's that's causing the problem. Right. For, for me, the panels don't disappear. So um, OK, so um, I just switched the mode on my button to one that will crop this thing. And I'm just going to show an outline box. So, which, whoops, a little box around it so I can see the faces. And I'm going to just move this front face and I'm going to push it back to cut into the thing. And oh, we need our shadows back. Otherwise, you can't see very well because there's no shadowing. You don't have the depth perception because you don't have the headset. So, there, I, I cut into it. Here, I'll cut into it a little more. And you can see what's inside. It's got some stuff. These these big like balls. Um, those are the the machines that sequester the iron and they convert iron two to iron three. And then you get these mineralized iron filling up this this compartment in the bacterium. Um, and it's going to use that iron later for enzymes that do various chemical reactions. Like the iron will be released and will be used in other places in the cell. Um, so let's look at some atomic models. Are there any questions about this? I'm going to show you a little bit about the atomic structure of this, a different kind of data that has sort of richer structure to in all the atom positions of the, all the proteins that make up this whole thing. Are there questions about this? I'll just say if anybody has any questions about the PDB format, which you're about to show like PDBs or the molecular files, uh, please follow up with me. I'll be happy to dive in and uh, help connect you and show you um, how awesome these files are. OK. Questions? More? Any others? OK, cool. Here's what here's the plan. Let me tell you what's in terms of that nano engineering using this. Like what do the engineers want to know? How did these balls in here, which it's called ferritin, ferritin and it's, it's proteins. One of these balls is 10 proteins in the, the form this unit. 
that are converting the iron and, and storing it. Um, how did this machine get inside this shell? Well, and the shell is called, it's, a, it's made of a, a different protein called encapsulin. So we have two proteins. Encapsulin makes this capsule, the spherical shell, and ferritin makes these, there are four of these like machines inside the shell. How can an engineer put a different machine inside the cell? Well, um, the protein here actually has a connection to um, the inside of the shell. So it's a protein and a string of amino acids, and there's a localization signal in its uh, sequence of amino acids of the protein. So a tail of the protein, which extends out, and it's probably about, you know, yay big between my cones here, and it's flexible and it sticks to the inside of this shell in a way that's specific to the genetic sequence. It's nine amino acids. And so what I'd like to show you is, let me show you the atomic model of both the ferritin and the encapsulin. And then we don't actually have the connection here because in this electron microscopy, you can't see the connection because the, the, uh, the little linker is too thin and is sort of randomly positioned. And this kind of electron microscopy data came from averaging 100,000 different images. And so if the linkers point or in different ways in different images, you don't see anything. So, but we'll make the linker uh, a model of it. So that's my plan. Uh, what are we doing for time, Jeremy? What time is it? I don't have a, in VR, I don't have any clock. It is uh, 3.32, so halfway through. Okay. More. Okay. So I'm going to bring up atomic model. First, I'm going to bring up atomic model of. Uh, actually, here's one thing I was going to show you, but I'm going to skip it because uh, I think it will be fun to get on. But I'll tell you about it. Um, I could just remove this whole shell and show all three or all four of these guys in the middle um, by just radially clipping it away. I'd have to press some toolbar buttons. I'd drop a little marker in the center, and I'd say hide everything more than a certain distance from the center, all just with the VR controllers. Um, but I want to get on to the atomic models because those are pretty cool. And so I'm going to skip that stage. We've seen a few ways to see these machines inside. So let me pull up our first atomic model. And the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to um, just bring up a little pane of my, the recent files that I have been looking at. Uh oh, I see my uh, camera froze here. Don't like that. Uh, let me just try getting rid of this and see. Oh, thank God, it's back. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. working again, Tom. This morning, I didn't realize that. Like when I brought up that panel, uh, which showed little icons for all the recent data sets that I have fetched from databases, um, it froze my, my video from the depth sensing camera. And I thought, oh no, the depth sensing camera is overheated. And I didn't realize I just have to get rid of the panel when it comes back. All right, you see now with my EM, this is the atomic model, this colorful thing that, that just we just brought in. And what I want to do is I want to put it in the EM data in the right position. And so I got a mode for that. I just assign my button. I usually, when I assign the buttons, these are the old Vive controllers. Uh, some, sometimes I use Valve Index, sometimes I use Oculus Quest 2. Um, I used, right now I'm using a Vive Pro headset. I like this one because it's very comfortable. Um, but I have many buttons I can assign. And I usually don't assign the trigger buttons because the trigger ones on the bottom are really convenient for just grabbing it and moving it around. So I don't like to change those. So instead, I usually end up assigning Let's see if I can show you the thumb button. There's a thumb button here to these new modes. So I'm going to assign the thumb button to one that lets me just point at this model and move it without moving the EM data. Uh, so it's called drag model. Boom, I do that. I point at it. Actually, let me get rid of my outline box too. I don't think I need that anymore. So I'll click a little button. And then I'm going to just take this guy. So now I can move him around. I'm just going to uh, stick him in here. Let's see, maybe I'll maybe I'll put him in here, right here. Okay. 
Okay, so I'm just putting it in the electron microscopy. It's going to build a model. This atomic model came from X-ray crystallography, some other technique. And it, the different colors, there are 10 different colors, are 10 different copies of the ferritin protein. Each one is identical, and I just color them differently so that you can see that there are 10 different ones. Okay, so that's the ferritin. Um, and now I want an atomic model of this shell. That's the encapsulin protein. So I'm going to uh, risk um, freezing my video and having it never come back again and bring up my panel of recent data. And I'm going to bring this atomic model of the encapsulin. So let me do that. And it's probably going to freeze here for a second, but let's do that. Let me get rid of this. Oh, good. We're back. We're back. Hooray. See this blue thing? Okay, this is five copies of the protein that makes up this shell. Now, the shell is made from 60, 60 copies. It's an icosahedron, but um, the atomic model from the protein data bank had just a pentamer, just five copies. I mean, I could, I could make a full shell of 60, but for the purposes of what I want to show you, five is plenty good enough. And so I'm going to take this one and I'm going to move it here, like where the EM says this should be. I'm just building an atomic model of the, this electron that, like the researchers who published this two weeks ago, they did this, not in VR probably. I doubt they used VR for it. Um, but they fit the atomic models that were known. Actually, they computed this atomic model from the electron microscopy. It's at like a resolution of about three angstroms. So they can see all of these, not every individual atom, but all of the amino acids, which are each 10 or 20 atoms, and they can position them all. So they computed this one. This other one, the ferritin, came from some previous work. But now we can build a, a little atomic model representing what we see in the electron microscope here. Let me tell you a few things like this is about VR we're talking. And I normally do these things with the mouse because I don't turn on my VR headset. And I just am used to doing it with the mouse. So what I just did, I took this, I took this model and I said, let me put it in the EM. Boom. You know, what do I do when I'm I'm using a mouse when I do that? Well, the mouse only works in 2D. So I, I move the model over a little bit and then I See that if I rotate, oh, it's totally out of position. I move it and I rotate and I move it and I rotate the, the whole view to get a view. And then I see, oh, the rotation is wrong. So I use a different mouse mode to rotate the model. And like a minute later, in this step that I just go boom and I look, it takes advantage of the fact that the hand controllers are like six degrees of freedom. Like I rotate and translate all in 3D at once. And so some things become very easy in VR that are quite tedious with the mouse. Um, so if I were building like a whole shell and placing these things by hand, I'd have to place 12 copies of this pentamer to build up the full 60 copies. I would definitely do it in VR because it's very efficient with these six degree of freedom input. All right, any questions? It's been a while since we had any questions here. I'm getting, I think I'm talking to myself. Do the pieces just snap into place or do you have to position them manually? Oh, great question. I was gonna show you that and I, I'm kind of cutting corners here. Um, when we do this kind of fitting in, um, in Chimera, usually we put the atomic model in just roughly by hand, then we optimize it with a gradient ascent method to get the maximum density at these atom positions. And there's a toolbar button to do that. Um, let's see, I'll, I'll show you how that optimization works, I guess. Um, let me, um, I would normally just type a quick command to do it. So in VR, I'll do it, I'll go to my toolbar that says map, and there's a button called fit, but it's gonna complain because it doesn't know which atomic model do you wanna fit here. It doesn't do both. It only does one at a time for safety. And so I'm gonna hide my ferritin model here. I have a panel. Let's see, I don't think you can see it down there. It's here, here are my, here's my model, and I'm gonna hide, whoops, what I do here. 
I was going to try to hide. Okay. Crap. I'm not quite sure what they did. Oh, I did this, probably. Yes. No, I didn't do that. All right, things go awry, but it's good. It shows you, like, this is the, using a desktop interface, this panel. With a mouse, I would easily, like, select what I want and hide it. But, oh, I see, I was using the wrong scroll bar. There are two scroll bars on it. This is a real pain to use a desktop user interface with VR controllers in 3D. Um, but a lot of VR software does that. Okay, so I'm going to click. What? It's like sometimes it's nice to have like somebody helping to drive like on the desktop, but then you have to be careful too because if they move the object, it can make you motion sick. It can, yeah. but I, I want to give you in this. I hope you get from this demo a realistic view of like all, a lot of the exactly. work of VR. You're really pushing. So, you're really so, pushing the boundaries, Tom. This is awesome. You know, in fact, we should have Phil jump in eventually. Well, yeah, Phil will jump in in, a, in, in okay. a few minutes. How about that? So yeah. I just. I manage with a lot of fiddling, like geez, it took me a minute there to hide my ferritin model. And then I can click my fit thing, which will fit this atomic model into this map. I'll just click it and it just moved. I don't know if you saw it, it jumped not very much, like a few centimeters here, but that's actually a huge move in terms of the number of angstroms in right this structure. Now. Like the atom, you know, one atom moved like 10 times its diameter in that little jump. Um, so it really improves the, the fit. So, yeah, that's an important part of, of um, really doing. I'm, I'm giving you a quick and dirty version of what the researcher would do. Uh, actually, let me, let me bring back my favorite. I just want to point out, too, that this is meant to be like just to give you guys a taste of like what what Chimera can do. And if anybody's interested in further, more specific demos on working with like electron microscopy, uh, protein, uh, uh, the PDB format uh, or other protein files, we, you know, I think we'll be happy to um, coordinate in a, in a couple of weeks or maybe a little bit longer. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to discuss the line, especially if you're trying to use this tricky VR stuff. Um, so let me, uh, I'm going to hide my my electron microscopy now because I built this partial atomic model. I got a little toolbar button that does that on my map toolbar. Here's my atomic model of both the part of the shell, one of these ferritin complexes inside. And I was telling you that the researchers who are really excited about this, this system biologically are excited because they can engineer it and that this ferritin got inside because it had a little linker that connected to the shell. And we can see where that connection is made to the shell. It's in this different color. Let's see if I give you a good view here. See this kind of a greenish, yellowish color? Let's see, my cone, oh, my cone. Yep. It's, it's in here. Um, that thing is the end of the linker. And then it's supposed to have a little connection to this ferritin thing because it's all part of the single protein chain. And so I wanted to make that connection. And in fact, I wanted yesterday to build a model where each one of these 10 proteins that make up this ferritin complex has a little linker and it goes to the shell. And I wanted to see what it looked like. Like, let me build in that atomic linker between the two, because this is going to be like an octopus or an octopus with 10 legs connecting to the inside of the shell. And not only that, we have four of these inside. So there are 40 tentacles connecting these things on the inside to the inside of the shell. And I wanted to see things like how is the linker long enough to reach? Like how constrained is the system? So I wanted to build a model to see can these linkers reach? Um, so let me show you. I'm going to just do a few steps to show you how I did that. Um, so the first problem was in this experimental data, they didn't have the linker. So I needed to make the linker. So I ran AlphaFold, which is a protein structure prediction program. It uses machine learning. It's like super hot now. Every biologist is trying to run this thing because this uh, artificial intelligence method has done a fabulous job of predicting proteins structures. So I thought I'll get the linker by just predicting the protein structure. Because when you print, predict it, you get the full thing. So let me just pull that model up. 
that prediction took an hour to run on like some uh, high end GPU. Um, and so I'm going to bring it up. Uh, it's here in my. Oh, you don't see it's frozen, right? Forgot about that. I'm so okay. glad you're addressing this because Camille just asked this. Uh, Camille Lake and said, I know in regular Chimera X, AlphaFold is integrated. Is that true with VR as well? Um, so, uh, like, could I use AlphaFold within VR? Is that the question? Or yes. What? Yes, yes, um, that's it. So AlphaFold is like a heavy duty computation. And this protein is really small. Here's the thing I just loaded from AlphaFold. It's this. And here, let's see. Sorry, it's so far away from our complex, right? It's um, it's just a little tiny thing compared to this. This is a very small protein, only about 100 amino acids. It took one hour to run. If I were running, and I actually have run this whole 10 copies, it took like six hours to run. So. I'm not going to sit in here in VR and wait six hours for it to come up. So, but you can, but I did run this from Chimera X. I was just using it on the desktop and I just started the job. I went to the tools menu, structure prediction, and I pointed it to the sequence of ferritin and said go. And then I went and had lunch. And this one took an hour. And it came back with this. And I was absolutely stunned because I realized at lunch I screwed up. This protein, if you see, um, it's um, it's kind of it's got these alpha helices, and they're not clumped together, and so, and I need to get exactly the right shape so that this protein fits into my model here, and the reason it assumes the right shape is because there are other ones right next to it, and so usually you'd have to run alpha fold, and I would predict for instance, two copies of the protein so they could intertwine with each other the way two copies intertwine in this structure. And so I thought, I'm just going to have to rerun it after lunch and do it right. But AlphaFold, this uh, machine learning technique, like by some magic, I, I am just dumbfounded by this. It predicted a single copy that fits beautifully into this structure. So let me just show you that. Uh, I'm going to. Uh, I'm going to just move it here, uh, the usual game here. I just, whoa, what happened here? Move it over here, and let me put it in, in somewhere here. Okay, well, to get it to fit in, it's going to be a little tricky unless I show them in the same style. So let me show these atoms as a this ribbon cartoon style. This just shows the protein backbone chain. So I'll, let me just press a button here or two, and let's say hide those atoms and show those cartoons. Okay. Blowing my mind, Tom. I just show this here, and I'm going to drop like my alpha fold model in here. I'm just going to my hand. I'm just going to put it in. Let's see, which one will I align it with? Uh, I think I'll align it for fun with this gray copy here. We'll see how how well well we'll see how well machine learning did with this. Let's see. Do, do, do. And and there's even the molecular dynamics that you can do to make the proteins like move as it can go from one conformation to the other. You can import that data as well back into Chimera and then show them like even rotating or moving as they undergo a conformation. And then you can uh, control that animation using like a uh, like a slider. Okay, so you probably don't see this great, but my God, the thing like matches perfectly with wow. the full structure. And the way I did it, just like what we saw with the EM map, I said I fit it by hand and then I optimize it with EM. When I was, if I were doing this on the desktop, I wouldn't have done any of this hand placement. I would just type a little command called matchmaker. Say matchmaker, this alpha fold model to this chain of the ferritin. To do, do type short, very short command, and it would optimize exactly the fit. So, so this step is something I'm doing in VR, and I could do that matchmaker thing without a typed command, without using the keyboard, using a menu entry and a big user interface panel, and I could click and select the two things I want to align with each other. Um, but I thought I'm not going to show you that. Uh, I mean, you've see, you've seen it's cumbersome to use the panels. Okay, but you'll have to trust me 
like even though you don't have as good a view, this thing aligns very well. And we see the tail now. You see right um, this thing right here, this, this pink arc here, this is the tail that I was talking about. That's the linker. It's a piece of string basically that's connecting to the shell. And that's what targets the ferritin to be inside this shell. And so if I'm an engineer, a biotech engineer, and I need some like other protein put in here for some drug I'm giving to some human to fight cancer, then I'm gonna add the specific amino acid sequence in this linker so that it gets targeted to be inside the shell. All right, so let me show you now quickly. Um, uh, I, I wanna, last step I wanna do here is place this linker in its correct position, okay? And this is kind of a cool and somewhat crazy thing. Uh, I'm going to um, use molecular dynamics, just run a force field simulation and just drag it to the right position. So let's give it a try. Let's see if, see if this wipes out. So first I'm gonna show the atoms uh, again, and I'm gonna show, uh, okay, so here they are, we see the atoms, and I'm going to take the little linker and I'm gonna match it up with the part I know where it, it sticks on the inside of the shell. And I'm gonna enable, do it with this molecular dynamics. I enable this tugging mouse mode called tug. And then this runs on the GPU because these force field calculations have to be very fast. And then I'm gonna just point at an atom carefully with my cone. And it's so small here, I like, uh, let's see. Wait, do I have the right one? Yeah, I do. Okay, wait, it's too small probably. Like, even with a cone, like this is not comparable to a mouse. Like you're not on a flat surface where you can point absolutely precisely. My hands shake a tiny bit and then it's hard to, uh, uh, okay, there we go, we got it. Okay, so I'm running some, it's running some real time molecular molecular dynamics, and just gonna, oh, I'm kind of screwing it up quite a lot here, but let's see if the, if it can handle it. I'm just gonna move it over there. Then I'm gonna grab another, another atom here. Boy, my pointing is just atrocious. Maybe I just have to make it bigger. Okay, and then I'll drag another part, because I need like a little stretch of this to align. Whoa, okay, let me get back here. Then I'll drag another little part of it. And put it in here. Okay, and I see I've stretched my linker here quite a lot. Like this part is stretched and it started pulling on the protein. And um, I also see I screwed it up. The linker was supposed to go from sort of the outside here to the inside. And I just pulled it so it went, the linker went all the way to the inside and then came out. It's in the wrong order. I'm not gonna try to fix it now because I just wanted to give you the idea of how we could like start building this model and that cart start assessing like how big a linker, how long a linker do you need to reach to the, the proteins in the compartment? Okay, are there any questions? Wait, before I ask you for questions, um, I'm gonna have Phil Cruz from the NIH join me in a two-person VR session, where we're gonna try. So he can look at the model and Phil and I will talk about the model. Maybe we'll measure the distance of this linker. So I'm gonna start that in Chimera X. I'm gonna use a little menu entry and just start a, a multi-person meeting. The, Phil, Phil is on the East Coast, at NIH and I'm here in California and we're going to both be in VR looking at the same data. So let me take off the headset briefly and just start that meeting. And think of questions because once I click go on starting the meeting, then I want and Phil starts to join, then I want to answer questions. I go to tools, general meeting, that's a menu entry. And I'm going to call the meeting name is TG. That's just my initials. That's how Phil will join. He'll say, he'll start Chimera X and say, join the meeting called TG. Let me create the meeting. I just press some create button. Um, and the log, once it connects to a server that, okay. So the meeting should be up and running. Oh, don't, don't join yet, Phil. 
because there's a critical part. Oh, yes. That, that EM map is really huge, and I don't want it being sent to Phil because it will take forever. So I just closed that EM map. It was hidden, but it would have been sent to Phil. So Phil, can, Phil you, if you're on, you could try joining. Um, and we could both look at this. And, um, oh, hey, Phil, Phil popped up. This is Phil I'll, here. Yeah, I'll be Phil, standing hello. there in just a moment. <laughs> OK, and I'll show you, Phil, like what direction the camera's in. Like he doesn't know where. So the audience, Phil, is like looking right at me. Do you see me, Phil? Oh, this is cool that so the um the labels will always face the direction that tom is facing right now i mean it's not really set up just to do augmented virtuality but it's pretty cool that so that if you're using it you can always see the labels no matter which direction you're looking so where, where is the audience tom oh uh, so um i'm gonna let me show you where the camera is that, yes. we're, that we should face. I see I, in my VR, I can see this um, this real sense depth sensing camera, but Phil okay. can't. The camera is right here, Phil. So where my hands are, you see my. So cone? can you see me waving my controllers, everyone? Oh yeah, you're right. You're right in the middle. I'm right hand. next to you. You're visible. Very cool. Yeah. So we're in good. We're in good position. So Phil, I wanted to show you now that you have the good view. This linker I just placed. You could use, yeah. you could move it around too, like get a better view. Both of us can control it equally. Um, so I'm controlling it now. And there's no presenter. Like I don't like hand control to him. So Phil, if we both try to grab it and try to move it, like I'll, we just fight, okay? <laughs> so it's not like some other software where you have to hand off presenter. So, and Phil can do everything I just did, Phil can do too. We're just complete peers in this session. Um, Phil, could you, like, I'm curious how long this linker is. If you could, like, he can just set his thing to tape, a tape measure mode, and he can, like, measure. Uh, Let's see. Is, is it on your cone, your button there, the tape measure one? It is, but it. Let's see. Can I see, is it the distance? Because you want tape measure, not the distance. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. Distance, you'll right. have to click out. And it's over on the. Uh, this rollover. It's not wide enough. You click that little arrow, then it'll, you're, whoa, okay, there you go. Yeah, there we go. Okay, cool. And so I can just pick any arbitrary points in three dimensional space and 63.4 angstroms. I don't know if you can oh, see that. I, you know, I don't see your tape measure at all. Didn't we huh. try this earlier and it worked just fine? Yeah, we tried this before. Saw, okay, just some, I think some, some bug and totally you've had a, a had an error pop up um, oh, no. okay so let, let, let me do it because okay um I, it is it is some i just bug. cleared mine yeah I think you might have to like switch to desktop view tom and uh click okay to make this error go away which is covering the screen right now there's an I error think, you guys see yeah it what? says cannot create a oh, oh i see it i see it and you oh, can yeah, I, select I, show message again that might prevent it from Occluding. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, There's the check bar, the check box. Oh yeah, don't show this message again. <laughs> okay, and actually, I, I think it told me what the problem was, and it had to do with the marker. Like, or no, no I'm not yeah, sure. The log says deleted zero markers for marker delete number two. Phil, can you try it one more time, and then I'll try. Then I'll try it if it. Yeah, doesn't. let me try it again. We we, okay. we practiced yeah. this a few days this ago. This is perfectly smooth in the demo. <laughs> in our practice. Is that any better? <laughs> oh, I don't see it. No, it probably no. did it pop up an error again. No, it didn't. But let me let me try it. It, okay. probably, it might get the same error for me. But I'm gonna I'm gonna try uh, to just set this tape measure mode. Um, then I'm going to hide this. Then I'm gonna bring over this. Let's see if I can if it will if it will behave itself for me. And, you know, so the Chimerics has an excellent listserv, too, where you can join and get, like, all kinds of great information. Think, you know, so I, I drew this yellow line. Um, the number probably looks backwards to you, but it looks forwards to me. Um, Phil, do you see my yellow line? I see your yellow line. I see the number, 49.68. Yeah, so it's about 50 angstroms, like our linker roughly here. I, I went to the innermost in, part here about 50 angstroms. 
and, so, and you probably won't be able to see it, but you can go pretty precisely from one atom to another atom to measure the distance between two specific atoms even. Yeah. Uh, I okay. see it. It's 20.96 angstroms. But it, it didn't show, for whatever reason, our meeting is like slight, slightly gone bonkers here. Yeah. Or we went to different atoms. Mine says it's like 18 angstroms. But right. anyways, you get the idea. What I want to convey to the audience is, like, and Phil and I have done this a bunch of times before, and a lot of other researchers I've tried, I've used it, is we can just have some um, collaborative discussion. Like, Phil, I don't know if we looked at this before, but it, if you look FYI, inside. We're at four, four o'clock. Guys. Okay. Oh, okay. Where you can see all the, you know, we can discuss the structure and have this beautiful immersive 3D view. And you're looking at somebody's head image and you yes. see what they're looking at. So it's very so, effective. And if you have several people, you know, since we have these avatars, you can tell who is who and whose controllers are whose in this. Yes. Okay, so uh, we're at we're end of time. Um, I do want more questions if we're allowed to go over, Jeremy. Yeah, we can go over. I don't mind. And Quick Phil? question. Fantastic. Okay, question. Thank you so much. Um, because you're in VR and you are doing the collaboration, have you guys looked at using eyesight lines that show where that person's looking? So doing basically just a ray cast out in the VR so you know exactly the element someone's looking at? Um, so um, we've talked about, we don't even have something more basic, like a laser pointer from this cone. It would be kind of cool because sometimes, yeah, well, do you, I, I hadn't thought of your suggestion. Do it right from your eyes, what what your eyes are pointed at. But I think, I don't know if Phil would agree with me, but the way it works now with this dumb postage stamp image of his face, I can tell like, like very well, like as good as if Phil and I were in person here in the same room, yes. what he wants me to look at. He looks I, I can at, go. He, he focuses on it and his postage stamp is like completely aligned with his headset, perfectly and in real time aligned. And so I see what he's looking at. I could even face him as he's, I think maybe you hit recenter, Phil. Yeah, right? I hit reset. Sure. So there's a recenter button. Of a, like a natural indicator, I like that. So yeah, I, I, I think we've, I, I at least have been shocked at how well this dumb avatar conveys, you know, what the person is doing, what they want you to look at. When it's very natural. About posted stamp and not about fill, right? right? The, the, yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's really, to, oh, I was just going to say, fill. it's very natural. It feels like the person is standing next to you, even though all you see is this little avatar. And I mean, you, uh, you see their yeah. hands too. You see all their hand gestures and what they're, and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's frightening how, like yeah. uncanny valley like it is uh, what, the virtual I mean, presence the the idea of like you feel like they're standing next to you i i agree 100 percent. and you know at first i um you know i i was like kind of spitballing ideas when you're going to present and you know i was thinking well what if we had more realistic avatars and what if we had like this and that but really you don't need much i think just having even the um like the like postage stamp in the hands and, and the chat and that that makes it work. It just works. Uh, Other questions on any of, on any of this? I mean, anything you've seen or anything about the VR? Or... The response has been overwhelming. Great. This is such a fantastic um, presentation. And uh, yeah, I'm I'm hoping that we can set up. Uh, you know, I know there's been so much interest in in additional presentations, and I would love to do more with it in the future so um anytime you're willing to come back we'd love to have you tom and i'd also like to mention uh for in particular for anybody from nih in the audience uh we well it's under renovation right now but uh we have a biovisualization lab at uh the niaid uh building at fisher's lane in rockville and where we have several VR setups ready to go, where you can come and try this out yourself. There's a, you can bring a whole group of people. We have big screen monitors showing everybody what you're seeing in VR. And there'll be a giant uh, touchscreen video screen for doing meetings and things as well. And um, uh, if you just, if you'd like to come and get more information or, and um, I extend an invitation to those of you uh, outside of NIH as well, 
just contact me and we can arrange a demo for you as well. And uh, and my email address is phil, P-H-I-L dot cruz, C-R-U-Z, at NIH.gov. So that's P-H-I-L dot C-R-U-Z at NIH.gov. And please let me know and we can, we can uh, give you a demo and get you a chance to try all of this out yourself if you don't have the hardware. Awesome. And Phil, you work with uh, Daryl Hurt, who used to um, conduct classes uh, through CIT on how to use Chimera, and especially for making 3D, 3D printable objects and everything else. And you guys also help with the 3D print exchange, uh, 3D print at any checkup, which is That's amazing. Right. But That's um, right. this is phenomenal. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This yeah, is thank, so cool. Thank, so, thank you, Jeremy, for arranging that we could do this demo. That's the least I could do. You guys are, I just like, you know, I've used your, your tools all the time and I just, um, I'm just so blown away by how awesome it is. It's just, um, I really, really appreciate everything that you do. Thank you so much for uh, presenting. And uh, yeah, like I said, I hope to get you back and to do much, much more. And I'm happy to help anybody else to use these tools as well. Jeremy, could I could I make one extra comment? Sure, please. I'll just note that um, you know, in addition to all the intramural folks and folks at other agencies, that there were a number of extramural. Um, funding folks from the NIH on this call, and you know, I know I actually went back and looked through your 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 grant history, Tom. I just noticed that I I, I realized that NIGMS uh, General Medical Science is sort of your bread and butter for funding, but you know, additions or or software interoperability or you know, I'm I'm at the Cancer Institute, so you know, you wanted to map mutations onto this, and that was an additional thing. You know, there's other opportunities for federal funding. Doesn't not necessarily have to stick with just the one I see. And I think a number of institutes across the NIH are really interested both in the software itself, and then sort of I mentioned, you know, the the, the interaction paradigms that exist in other arenas, games and such, where you normally think mm -hmm. that takes a lot of funding. Well, it's funding, but it's also expertise. If you need funding to partner with folks that know the expertise and know actually there's this there's this widget set that's good enough, and we could use it, and it would really boost your um boost your software up. Uh, yeah. That's certainly something yeah. that's eligible for NIH funding, something to definitely pursue potentially. Yeah, Excellent. that's definitely exciting. And right currently, the virtual reality in Chimerax is funded by Daryl Hurt and, and um, through the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease. Mm. You probably saw our NIGMS Chimera X grant, yeah. but that doesn't cover any virtual reality. So the virtual reality has some separate funding right now. But yeah, collaboration to make this work better and to borrow ideas on how to do VR well, uh, we're all for it, yeah. And we'd like to talk, yeah. Fantastic. You can, okay. Thanks so much. This is, <laughs> and uh, you know, I, I want to say also that there's a lot of interest in um, medical imaging, and uh, especially for uh, clinicians. But you know, I know that's probably it's like there's a whole other high bar with that. But you know, it would be a really uh, an interesting um, discussion to have. Uh, you know, and if you're interested in talking to those people, I'm happy to facilitate any of that. But um, thanks again. This is so awesome. Yeah, it was. I think um, the, the response has been really um, positive. And, uh, Thanks thank everyone so for joining.